All right, let's, um, let's get started. My name is Daryl Holtz. I'm in the Adult Discipleship Division here at the Church of the Resurrection. This Lenten study is uh, a really fun experience for us because we're doing it on Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, and Thursday nights, but we're having different people teach. So Tuesday night, James Cochran from our Congregational Care Area uh, did the teaching in here. And last night, Dave McGee, who is our director of small groups, uh, taught in here. And tonight, I get to teach. And I didn't even realize it when they had us signing up, but I was brilliant in picking Thursday night. So practically anything you hear tonight that you're like, wow, I really got to write this down, probably came from James or from Dave. <laughs> and, and I just borrowed it from them. <laughs> but... Uh, but, uh, you know, meanwhile, I get to fill in uh, in between. Um, also, I, I want to point out that thanks to our terrific um, audio-visual team, I'm in possession of this really powerful laser pointer. Now, I will try to use it responsibly, but if, but if any table gets completely out of control, you know, they say don't expose yourself to laser radiation. So just, just keep that in mind. Well, okay, we are here tonight to talk about the second of five essential practices for a strong Christian life, and we're here to talk about growing, particularly through Bible study. And so, um, with, with that focus in mind, I, I want to start by just having us think about, is the, is the push button working, James? He said to use my thumb, and I am using my thumb, but I, I, maybe I messed it up with the laser. There we go. So I want to start with a, with a question. Just think about what movie do you quote the most? And, and we're going to give you about three minutes to talk about, that, talk about that around your tables, okay? So you can share your favorite quote or your favorite movie or whatever. Three minutes. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, uh, there, there was a point to that, by the way, but we'll get to that later. In the meantime, though, I want to tell you, I got to thinking about this question today myself, and, and um, I got to tell you, last night, Dave put up, you know, movies like Caddyshack. He, he's a little younger than I am. The one that came immediately to my mind was Casablanca which I probably learned before some of you were born, but um, I, I still think it may be one of the greatest movies ever made. The, the other one is kind of interesting. The other one that I quote a lot is Disney's animated version of Robin Hood. And the reason I quote that one a lot is because that one came along when our daughter, who has autism, was about six or seven years old, and she loved repetition. And so if we went for several months where we watched Robin Hood like three times a day, every day. So there are lines from Robin Hood that my son and I still just instinctively quote to each other when we're together. Um, but, but Casablanca, uh, the, the quote, the, the, the line that I quote the most from Casablanca is not actually the most famous line in the movie. I love to quote the line where the Nazi commander has told them to shut down Rick's tavern, and the police chief blows his whistle and says, we're shutting the place down, and Rick says, why? And the police chief says, I'm shocked, shocked to learn that gambling is going on in this establishment, at which point the cashier runs up to him and says, you're winning, sir. Uh, so, you know, uh, there, there are times where, you know, we're shocked about all kinds of things. But I also got to thinking about that movie. Some of you may already know this, but here's the most kind of pivotal minute and 20 seconds out of Casablanca. Yeah. Um, so did, did any of you notice something missing in that scene? The most famous quote from Casablanca is, play it again, Sam, and nobody says it in the movie. She says, play it, Sam. She says, sing it, play it for old time's sake, but nobody in the movie Casablanca ever actually says, play it again, Sam. I find that fascinating. That's the most famous quote from the movie, and nobody says it. Anyway, okay. 
Sometimes, by the way, that may apply to our Bible study. Sometimes people tell me things that the Bible says, and I think, I don't think the Bible actually says that. So, um, so in, your, in your Lenten journal, uh, I believe it's the Monday passage for this week, we read a story that Luke tells us in the Gospel of Luke about Jesus at the house of friends of his. And uh, it starts with, Mar with Martha, and she's busy getting the casseroles and the dinner rolls and everything prepared. And says so she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. And Martha came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. Now, sometimes I think we kind of misuse this story because sometimes we treat it as though Jesus criticized Martha for cooking and doing housework and trying to take care of her guests, and that, that isn't what he said. Hospitality was a value in, in that culture, and, you know, sometimes it still is in ours. But what he did say was that she shouldn't criticize Mary for doing something other than housework. And part of the reason that he said that, part of, the, part of what made that important, was this. This is a painting, by the way, of, of kind of the scene. You see Martha, you know, with the loaf of bread, Jesus sitting there, Mary sitting at his feet. That, that was an important detail in the story. Because what Jesus said was that Mary was doing something really valuable and important. In that culture, to sit at a teacher's feet was to take the posture of a disciple, of a learner. Later on in Acts 22, the Apostle Paul at his trial tells people he was a student of Gamaliel, one of the distinguished rabbinic teachers in Jerusalem, and he literally in Greek uses the phrase, I sat at Gamaliel's feet. So it wasn't just a, an indication of where you sat in the room, it was an indication of your relationship to the person at whose feet you were sitting. And Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet as a way of saying, I want to learn from this man. I want to be infused with what he has to share and what he has to teach us. And by affirming Mary, Jesus showed that he wanted not just a small group of, quotes, professionals, but he wanted everyone to learn and to grow spiritually. Most Jewish rabbis in that day and age wouldn't teach a woman. Some of them went so far as to write things that said a woman is incapable of learning. But Jesus said, no, let her sit here. It's important that everybody learn from me. And by the way, how do I know that? Well, I had to study the passage. <laughs> See, there's a, there's a reference source that's, that's listed up above, and we'll talk more about those later. You don't just fall into these things. You have to learn them. But see, you, you might find yourself thinking, well, now wait a second. What do you mean everybody has to learn? I mean, I leave my car, some of us do, to the professionals. I certainly do. I'm no mechanic. I certainly never try to fix my own teeth. I leave that to professionals. Why should I have to grow spiritually myself? Why can't I just leave that to Pastor Adam and, you know, a few other specialists around here? Okay, if you jump ahead in your, in your Lenten journal to Saturday, you find Ephesians 4. And Ephesians 4, the letter that was written to the church in Ephesus, says God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And his purpose in giving us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and the knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us, all of us, to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. It's about as high a standard as I can imagine anybody setting. See, so key phrases in that scripture. God gave some people, particular gifts to be evangelists and pastors and teachers, not to do all of the growing, but to equip God's people. That's all of us. 
God gifted some people to equip all of us, you, to join in God's mission in the world. And the goal that God has in mind is we all reach God's goal and we are mature. So God's goal is not a few mature people feeding all the rest of us. It's not the, not the body of Christ, the church, as a kind of a perpetual spiritual nursery. It's that all of us mature and grow into the stature of Christ. That's why spiritual growth is so important. And, and, and just to further underscore that, doesn't God love and accept us just the way we are? Why do I have to grow? Well, okay, I want to be clear. We do not need to grow in order to earn God's favor. God loves us. God values us. The gospel is totally clear that God accepts us out of God's love and grace and not because anything we have done has earned our way into God's favor. That's not why we have to grow. But I love this this way of saying it. God loves you just the way you are. God loves you too much to leave you just the way you are. See, we, we are all flawed. We all have areas that aren't quite what they ought to be in our lives. And eventually, those things cause us harm. They cause us pain. They damage relationships. They, they hurt us. God wants us to grow out of those things for our sake. And he calls us to grow into good things excuse me, far more than he calls us to grow out of bad things. Because bad things tend to wither away as we grow spiritually. And so Ephesians says, we are God's accomplishment. The Greek word there is actually the Greek word poema, which is the word behind our English word poem. Some translations say we are God's workmanship, God's craftsmanship. God shapes us. We are created in Christ to do good things. The reason we need to grow spiritually is because God wants us to become all that we can be. And the way we do that is by growing spiritually, by learning from Jesus. So it's your turn. We're going to give you about eight minutes here. Think about these two questions. When did you accomplish something that gives you a sense of satisfaction that you can feel righteously proud about? And did that happen by accident, that you got really good at something? Did it, was it something you intentionally aimed to accomplish? And how might you prioritize your spiritual growth in the same way you would make any other life achievement a priority? And then also just think about learning style. In what ways do you learn best? Because we don't all learn the same way. That's one reason I've got pictures up and I'm talking words, and if I could sing, I would, but you don't want me to do that. In what ways do you learn best, and how might this shape your spiritual discipleship? What kinds of learning opportunities will serve you best to help you grow spiritually? you got eight minutes. All right. Time's up. Hey, a couple of things before I forget. One is, would you guys join me in saying thank you to James and to Jordan who are running the sound on the computers for us back there tonight? I, I promise you that if they weren't doing what they're doing, you'd have trouble hearing me and you wouldn't be able to see a thing on the screen. So, very, very grateful. Thank you, guys. I also want to comment, you guys did a great job. The, it, it's fascinating to me when when I say it's your turn and I let you talk, how the energy in the room goes up. See, and, and I was delighted when they told us that this is how they wanted us to build these lessons for the Lenten study, that we, that we had to include times where you got to talk because my observation over the years has been that almost invariably, you learn more and you take away more from something you hear from somebody at your table or something you say at your table than you do from anything I say. So I'm really glad that you guys are jumping in and participating, and I thank you for that. So here's a key verse, and again, it's in your journal for this week. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young friend and protege Timothy, and probably the last letter he ever wrote, by the way, Second Timothy was probably... The last letter Paul wrote, he says he's expecting the executioner to come any day and end his life. But he says to Timothy, make an effort to present yourself to God 
as a tried and true worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, but is one who interprets the message of truth correctly. One of the things that he recognized, as he wrote to Timothy, was growing and learning from the Bible takes effort. It doesn't just happen. And why does it take effort? Well, the Bible is a library of 66 different books written by 40 or more different people, written from 2,000 to perhaps 3,100 years ago. The books are in different styles. Some of them are poetry, some of them are storytelling, some of them are sermons, some of them are parables, some of them are letters, lots of different styles of writing. And they were written under different conditions. And sometimes they spoke to particular problems in their time, And at the same time, they were carrying God's eternal life principles for us to learn from in our time. So with all of those factors at play, when we read the Bible, that's why Paul wrote, make an effort. Because it takes effort. We don't automatically know what life was like two or 3,000 years ago. We don't automatically know what conditions those people were facing. We don't automatically know why certain counsel would have been given to them. It does take effort. At the same time, this was uh, the passage uh, that Pastor Wendy used last week in worship. I keep your word close in my heart so that I won't sin against you. Your word is so pleasing to my taste buds. It's sweeter than honey in my mouth. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. That's from Psalm 119. When I was a kid in Sunday school, we learned that that's the longest chapter in the Bible, but that didn't tell us much about it. The Psalms are poetry, by the way. See, you know, when it says, your word is so pleasing to my taste buds, it's sweeter than honey in my mouth, it does not mean pick up your Bible and start chewing on it. Okay? That's poetry. That's imagery. But it's valuable imagery. Because that tells us that in addition to effort, learning and growing from the Bible takes appetite. And and that's an interesting uh, idea to think about. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they will be fed until they are full. And one of the implications when he says, happy are people like this, is that not everybody is like that. That it isn't a given that we all have that hunger and that thirst for righteousness. But he says, you know, we're we're blessed, we're happy if we have it. And if we are open, God is going to give us that inner appetite to learn from Jesus through the words of the Bible. And it is appetite, that sense of, oh, it's it's so delicious. I mean, the, the images get all mixed up as poetry does. It goes from being sweeter than honey to being a lamp before my feet. It's a good flashlight, too for life, and so on. But it's appetite that makes us willing to make the effort to learn and to understand and to grow. None of us puts out a lot of effort for something we don't care anything about. I'm a baseball fan, so recently I noticed that, uh, that uh, a minor league team in a city near where my sister lives Uh, has a special promotion going on in July. So I sent off an email. I said, hey, you want to go to a game with me in July? And she wrote back and said, no baseball for me. I don't care what what the promotion. She doesn't like baseball. She has no appetite for it. So it it doesn't matter what the team promotion is or anything else. She's not interested. Well, see, that's what happens if we have no appetite for learning from the Bible. It's like, I'm sorry, just don't bother me with that stuff. We need for God to give us the appetite in order to be willing to put forth the effort. So what kind of effort does it take? Here's here's a key distinction. Much of the reading that we do in our life is for information. I mean, the light bill comes and we whip it out of the envelope and we scan it, you know, how much are they charging this month and did the rates go up and, and, you know, so on. News stories are, are read for information. Why did that plane crash in Ethiopia? Why is the river flooding? What's going on? You know, what's happening? 
the, book, the kinds of books we call beach reading are, are usually read for a different kind of information. And, and in all of that reading for information, our goal is speed and efficiency. How quick can I get through this? I'm in the middle of a mystery story right now, and I had a tough time breaking away to come up here to teach tonight because I'm, I'm getting close to the end, you know. And I want to finish it fast. But when we read the Bible, we don't read for information or just for information. We can get some information from it, but we read the Bible for transformation. And reading for transformation is a slower, more focused, more reflective kind of reading. You don't read the Bible the way you read a newspaper story. This, this is a, a wonderful teacher. You're going to hear him quoted several times tonight. A man named Eugene Peterson. He's the man who did the Message Bible, if any of you have ever had a chance to get that or read that. Um, he wrote another book. It was based on the psalm that says, Your word is sweeter than honey in my mouth. He called the book, Eat This Book. And he wrote it about how to read the Bible. And he says there is a certain kind of writing that invites this kind of reading. We taste and savor anticipate and take in the sweet, spicy, soul-energizing words. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He describes it as reading that enters our souls as food enters our stomachs, spreads through our blood, and becomes holiness and love and wisdom. That's the kind of reading that we need to be willing to do if we're going to grow from our Bible reading. Not just facts, but this inner transformation, this, this, this power that, that enters our souls and spreads through our blood and makes us different people. And, you know, as we read the Bible, as I said, we're reading documents that are 2,000 years or more old. So some of the ways that we need to slow down as we read and study these documents, some of the ways that we can savor it and let it enter us and spread through our systems. One is we need to constantly be referring in our own minds and asking ourselves, how does any one text, any one passage fit into the epic overall story that the Bible tells? Again, Eugene Peterson, this Bible turns out to be a large comprehensive story, a meta-story. Well, you know, as I say, I'm reading a mystery story right now. I can't start at chapter 17 and expect to know what's going on because it relates to all the rest of the story. The characters are all kind of interconnected and different things that happen are related to an overall plot. And the Bible is very much that way too, although it's, it's again, larger, more complex, more varied. But we, we've tried to give you a few tools here at the church to make it easier to keep track of the Bible's big story so that you can think about how the different pieces of the Bible fit into it. One that you may be familiar with is what we call the stained glass window. <sighs> you see it every week when you come to church. Um, see, and the, and the stained glass window is designed to tell you, in pictorial form, the big story of the Bible. It starts with creation goes through all of God's people, finds its center in Jesus and his redeeming life and death and resurrection, and moves on from there into how his followers have lived out the faith until it reaches its triumphant conclusion in the world made new. That, in pictorial form, that's the big story of the Bible. So as you read a passage of the Bible, you can ask yourself, which one of those panels of the big, of the, of the, of the big stained glass window would this passage fit into? That's a simple way to, to start thinking about how does this relate to everything else around it. Of course, um, unless you have a lot of spare time and live fairly close, you aren't going to come up here every day. So we also put together a little booklet we call The Bible's Big Story, the GPS Guide to the Bible's Big Story. Some of you probably already have a copy of this. We, we give them away free. We keep them in the rack out in the entryway here. Um, if you don't have one, I brought a box of them tonight, and they'll be sitting on the table when you leave. You're welcome to pick one up. Uh, we'd, we'd love for you to have it. And as a little bonus, it's got a color reproduction of the stained glass window in the back and a little appendix that talks about how the stained glass window tells the Bible's big story. So those are a couple of tools that will just help you 
think about where does each piece that I study and that I read fit into the overall story of the Bible. Oh, it's probably been said a dozen times in different contexts, but a verse without a context is a pretext. If you don't know what the verse, how it fits into the big story, you don't know if you're using it in, 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 in the right way, in a way that fits what God intended. And ultimately, the context of any verse is the Bible's big story. Now, you don't have to read the whole Bible every single time you read a verse, but, but it's useful to have that outline of the big story in mind as you fit the different pieces. It's just like when you're doing, doing a puzzle. You've got all the little pieces to fit in, but it really helps if you've got the big picture sitting there in front of you. It helps you know where to put the pieces. That's one way that we kind of need to slow down. And we also have to understand the text's original meaning before we try to apply it to our life. And, and, and this is sometimes, for me, and, and I'm sure for you, sometimes we're tempted to hurry on that. Let's just not spend all this time. I need an answer right now. So we want to grab a Bible verse and have it tell us the answer. But if we don't know what it was saying when it was written, again, the answer we get out of it might not be the answer that we need to get. This is from uh, Pastor Adam Hamilton. When you read any New Testament letter, and I would say any part of the Bible, any psalm, any, any whatever, when you read any biblical document, you are reading someone else's mail. And Christians often forget this. They read Paul's letters as if he wrote just for them. I once knew a guy who was buying some property and had to decide whether to pay for city water lines to run out there or to dig a well. And one day he got very excited because he read in Galatians 6 a verse that said, be not weary in well-doing. And he said, I got my Bible answer, I have to dig a well. And that wasn't at all what Paul was intending when he wrote that verse, see? So, you know, here's a, here's a made-up example. Fame, one, maybe the most famous verse in the Bible, except for John 3.16. Psalm 23, one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If I read that and I think to myself, oh, there is so much that I want and I can't afford it. So I think this verse promises me that God's going to send me a big raise so that I'll be able to buy that new car and that big house and, and the golf clubs and the vacation. And I shall not want, right? Well... Actually, probably not. The realities of shepherd life in Bible times were not that shepherds provided sheep with a luxurious life. It was that they provided sheep with the basic necessities to keep them alive. Sheep aren't good self-feeders. They need somebody to go find good grass for them. They need somebody to find clean water for them. And that's what the psalm was talking about. It was probably written by King David, who'd been a shepherd boy. And it was saying, God is my shepherd, and therefore I will get the basics that I need. So if I try to use it to promise me a big raise to buy all the luxury stuff I want, I'm probably missing the point. Okay, so with that as background, your turn again. Think about something you're good at. Were you good at it the first time you tried it? And, and, you know, think about your favorite movie. This is the point. Think back to that favorite movie. Did you know all the quotes the, the first time you watched it? Did you never go back and watch it again because you said, I've got it down cold? I, I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it, it was at least the fourth or fifth or sixth time that I watched Casablanca before I thought, I want to watch for that uh, Play It Again Sam quote and noticed it's not in there. Uh, it took a while. So think about what light that casts on how you can become better at Bible study for your spiritual growth, and then spend some time thinking about what practical steps could you take to create space to spend time growing in your faith, because it does take effort, and effort sometimes takes time. What might you need to sacrifice, and what might you need to do more of in order to maximize the growth you get out of Bible study? All right, around your tables, you've got another eight minutes. And that's our eight minutes.
I am going to borrow a really precious story that uh, James Cochran told on Tuesday night. James and his wife have a little girl who I think he said is about four years old. And one night they were talking about some of the social and cultural issues going on around us, and in particular some of the issues that relate to trying to see to it that women get treated fairly and equally with men in terms of pay and working conditions and a variety of things like that. And in the middle of that discussion, James exclaimed, down with the patriarchy. And he said his little girl looked up at him and said, what, what did you say, Daddy? Because she didn't quite know the word that he had just used. So he sat down with her and, and he took her kind of or, or syllable by syllable through it, down with the patriarchy, you know, and taught her how to pronounce the word. And then at the end, to give her some practice, he said, down with the patriarchy. And she looked up at him and she said, down with the pantry monkey. <laughs> That's just an adorable story, but as I thought about it, Again, I kind of related it back to our subject for tonight. Sometimes when we run across an unfamiliar idea in the Bible, we just sort of turn it into an idea that is familiar to us and say, that must be what the Bible meant. But if we're not careful, we end up with down with the pantry monkey instead of what the Bible was really trying to say. So anyway... Um, see, the, the thing that I just really feel concerned about as I teach you about the fact that it takes effort and it takes study and it takes work and it takes time is I don't want you to leave here dejected tonight telling yourself, oh, I don't know the Bible, I don't know ancient history, I don't, I'm not spiritual, I can't, you know, I can't do the stuff those Bible students do. Please don't do that. And, and here's, here's why. Again, I, I got this from James. I got an email from James as we were working on these talks and he had like one line in there that said something like, Carol Dweck's mindset writing. And I sent him back an email and I said, who is Carol Dweck? <laughs> and, and he sent me an answer. Carol Dweck is a researcher at Stanford University, it turns out. And she's done a lot of work on how it is we think and how we picture ourselves and how we picture other people. And a part of what she has written is we like to think of our champions and our idols as superheroes who were born different from us. We don't like to think of them as relatively ordinary people who made themselves extraordinary. If we find somebody we admire in music or in sports, we want to think, oh, they're just so much better. And we don't necessarily like to think they practiced for hours and hours and hours and hours. Now, I think I could practice as long as I want, and I still wouldn't be a, a good big man in the NBA. You know, I'm 6'2". But, but nevertheless, Carol Dweck has an important point. And, and, and so, you know, Adam Hamilton tells us he spends 10 or 20 hours a week studying for his sermons. It isn't that he just knows this stuff, and we don't. Even now, after years and years at it, he works at it. He puts effort into it. Well, the point is, then, no matter your age or your life stage, and again, this is Carol Dweck's research, you're not in a fixed, inflexible place. It's not like, well, I'll never know that because I don't know it now. You're always in a position where you can grow. God calls us to grow, and every one of us can grow. Every one of us can learn more than we used to know. Every one of us can be more than we used to be. It's never true that I'll never be any more or any different than I am now, unless we have no appetite for it and we're unwilling to put any effort into it. All of us can learn. All of us can grow. We won't all be identical. I'll never be Adam. But that's okay. I can be me, and that's all God calls me to be. But I can be the best me that I can be if I'm willing to put in the effort. So please don't leave here going, yeah, never be like that. You can change. You can grow.
And so we have tried to put some thought into identifying for you some tools for you to grow through Bible study. Um, I, I'm going to talk about them here, but we've also got uh, just a sheet of paper. On one side, it lists some Bible study tools. We didn't try to make it a long, comprehensive list. It just lists some basic, basic tools that you can get. On the back, it has some basic practices, and we'll talk about practices in a minute. And those will be on the table back there along with the big story booklets if you want to pick one up on your way out tonight. These are tools for growing through Bible study. Now, I, I want to underscore another key difference that people have talked about. Most of these tools we're going to talk about are printed. Most of them these days can also be obtained as e-books, but that's a matter of taste. But there is a difference between a book that helps you read the Bible and a book about the Bible that you read instead of the Bible. And I would encourage you, make sure that whatever other tools you have and whatever other reading you do, that you're always going back to the Bible as the source. Don't find yourself in a position where I've read 19 interesting books about the Bible, but I've never cracked the Bible open. Um, the, the point is... The Bible is the place that through the centuries, God's people have said, this is where we find nourishment for our souls. So use the other tools to help you read the Bible, not in place of reading the Bible. Okay, with that, one tool that's just basic is a good study Bible. There are lots of them. Uh, just so you know, I got this off Amazon.com. I think the CEB study Bible is the best study Bible available. That's some guy named Hamilton who pastors in Kansas. Um, so if you don't have a study Bible, I would urge you to seriously consider the one that he likes. If you do have one, and it's a good solid one, use it. it it's not that you know, there's only one good one in the world. But study Bibles take the Bible text, and every study Bible is built on a basic major translation. Some, a lot of them use the NIV, some of them use the Common English Bible. Uh, some of them use the New, New Revised Standard Version. There's a lots, lots of study Bibles. They're all built on a translation, but then they add study notes. And it's the study notes that are different from one to another if they use the same translation. So find one that makes sense to you. Find one that seems to fit kind of the way that you want to study the Bible. And as you go through and as you read different verses, you'll find references to other Bible passages that relate to that. You'll find historical background information, all that kind of thing. Then there are a number of really good non-technical commentaries. There are big technical commentaries, I promise you. I, I have a few, I've seen many. They print the text all in Hebrew and Greek, you know, and, and so on. They're for specialists. But there are really good non-technical commentaries uh, that anybody can read and make sense of. We've listed some on our sheet. There are study guides that are similar, but they tend to be a little shorter and ask more thought questions. And, you can use them in a small group, or you can use them for your personal study. And again, we have, we'll have that list on the table of some that we recommend to you. And uh, you, can, you can get as many or as few of those as you feel a need for. Don't overlook other people as a resource for Bible study. Um, it doesn't have to be on, in print and between hardcovers. For one thing, pastors and teachers can be a real resource for Bible study. I, I have, I, you know, I teach a few classes here at the church, and both Tuesday night and Wednesday night, as Jim, James and Dave were wrapping up their sessions, I had people who'd been in class with me come over to me and say, hey, we had a question at the end of the session, and, and so on. I hope I helped them. I think I did. Get, find people that you trust. Pastors are, are you know, we, we, we talked our pastors here, every single one of them says, oh, I'd love to sit and answer somebody's questions about the Bible and help them understand better what they're reading. I mean, you got to fit their schedules, and you're, you're probably not the only one who wants to talk to them. Adam kind of makes a point of, of noting that uh, lots of people are tugging at his sleeves, but, but nevertheless, that's something that's a delight for people who've studied the Bible, is to be able to help other people study the Bible. And, and remember that passage we read in Ephesians 4. It says, God gave some to be pastors and some to be teachers 
to equip God's people. If you never let them equip you, you're not helping them do their job, their God-given assignment. Now, I, I will tell you that having someone who helps you with the Bible doesn't automatically mean you won't still have to think. I have a very clear memory of a time in my junior year in college as a theology student. There were two teachers who I really admired. Dr. Peter Luna was a Hispanic background man from Southern California, had a wonderful, warm, gentle personality, and I loved his classes and I learned so much from him. Dr. Irwin Gain was an Australian, big, forceful, commanding personality. Very dynamic. And I loved sitting in his classes. And one year, I found myself in a class with each of these two of my, my two favorite teachers, and it was awesome. And I would sit there, and I would listen, and I would take big notes, you know. Oh, wow, they're teaching me so much. And one day, they both addressed kind of a hot theological topic that was going on. And I sat there, and I nodded, and I took my notes. And it was only when I walked out of class that it hit me they had taken exactly opposite views of this, of this controversial subject. And I was like, well, I love them both, and I admire them both, and I'm going to have to think about which one I agree with. Darn. So just having a teacher doesn't automatically mean you get out of thinking. But nevertheless, it can be a wonderful resource, and it can be wonderfully helpful. Of course, another way to enlist other people in helping you study the Bible, and one we really favor and one we really encourage, is to get in a small group. That's one of the reasons we have you sitting around tables here. At least in a, in a short time, you get a chance to experience what it can be like to be talking with other people and sharing ideas and, and, and sharing insights and, and growing together. And some of you are sitting around a table with your small group, and that's awesome. But if you're not, think about getting in a small group. Because in a small group, you get wonderful sharing, mutual support. There, there are times, you know, when, when our life, the wheels kind of fall off. I've, I've been teaching a Disciple three class this year. One of our members just went, just in the last week, her, she, she's been worried because her elderly father is struggling with his health and her, her elderly mother has been taking care of him and it's been a burden and she's been trying to help her mother. And her mother was having trouble getting over what they thought was pneumonia. And they took her into the hospital and it turns out she has metastasized cancer in her lung and in her bones and, and so on. I mean, it, it, you know, but at least all the rest of us are there to pray for her and to encourage her and to help her in any way we can. So that's one benefit. But along with that, see, in a small group, as you spend time at it and you build, it, build trust, you get accountability. One important thing about Bible study to remember is it's not just an intellectual exercise. I mean, we, 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 we sort of hint at that when we say you're not reading for information, you're reading for transformation. But see, transformation, James in his letter said, be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. And in a small group, you get people who can look at you and say, so how's it going with whatever it was that you were intending to see transformed in your life? How's that coming along? And sometimes that's a little scary and a little uncomfortable, which is why you have to invest time and build trust. But it's really valuable to have somebody who cares enough about you to say, so, are we doing what we said we were going to do? Are we growing? Are we finding transformation? So, those are some tools for Bible study. Practices that will help you in Bible study. You heard last week in worship, if you were here, about sacred reading, also in the Latin, called Lectio Divina. That is uh, an approach that focuses kind of meditatively on a particular passage of Scripture, goes through it four times, looks at different aspects of it. There was a good guide to it in the bulletin last week, so I'm not going to walk you through all the details of it. Uh, again, we've got some, some write-up on the back of the Bible study tool sheets. But the, the essence of, of this kind of sacred reading, uh, again, Eugene Peterson quotes, the Ger German poet Rilke wrote of a reader who often leans back and closes his eyes over a line he's been reading again. 
and its meaning spreads through his blood. That's the idea of this sacred reading practice is I don't rush through it. John Ortberg wrote in one of his books that he set himself a goal to read all of the Psalms in a certain period of time. It, it, it added up to three Psalms a day. And then, you know, a few days into it, he realized he was just rushing through the three to get, the day, get them out of the way for the day as fast as he could so that he could get onto his office and do his work. And it was like, that wasn't the point at all. He wasn't getting anything out of it by rushing through it like that. So however you go about it, that's part of it. It's just taking the time to, to let it sink in. The Genesis to Revelation series of study guides, they use a very helpful pattern, I think, of intentional questions. Just three simple questions, and you can pretty much keep this in mind and use it anytime with any Bible passage you read. Question one, what does the text say? That's, that's a little bit like my Casanova, or my Casanova, I guess a Blanca quote. What does the movie actually say? Because it doesn't say, play it again, Sam. You do that with a Bible text. Sometimes, I, I mean, I catch myself still. I, I'm sure I know what it said. And then I read it, and it's like, oh, it didn't actually quite say that. Hmm. Question one, what does the text say? Question two, what does the text mean? And question three, what does the text mean for me? How do I apply it to my life? That's a really easy little outline to memorize, and you can use it with pretty much any Bible text you read. So those are some practices that you may find helpful. There are others. There are all kinds of ways that God's people have read the word through the years. But the last one I want to talk about is memorization. And uh, again, um, Eugene Peterson passed away last year. And a year or so before that, he sat down for a radio interview. And he talked about the way he had gone about taking the scriptures into himself and into his life. And we've got about a three-minute clip of what he had to say. So I want to play that for you now. That is one of the great teachers, writers, preachers of our time, talking about a way that he had found that helped him internalize what the Bible said and make it a part of himself. And, and that's what memorizing does. It makes those key parts of the Bible available to you wherever and whenever. I mean, you know, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but last weekend at church we said, if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a pocket testament. And I was tempted to stand at the door and say, you know, there's more to the Bible than the testament. <laughs> uh, I didn't. I'm a team player. But... <laughs> Um, but the point is, you don't, if you memorize something, you don't need a pocket testament, you don't need a, a Kindle, you don't need a smartphone. Wherever you are, that text will be with you. And, and that literally, truly, I mean, we've, we've used the metaphor of, you know, making it, letting it spread into your blood like food and stuff. Memorizing literally makes it a part of you. It becomes a piece of who you are. And not just something that's out there. So... That's something to consider. A lot of us, me included, are like, oh, memorizing is hard, and I don't want to take the time. Look, you can put something on your mirror or on the dash of your car or someplace where you just see it every day, and in 30 or 45 days, you'll find that you know it. You don't even have to sit there consciously going, okay, I'm going to try and memorize this. So that's, I just encourage you to consider that. Okay, to close... I want to take us back to the wise, weathered old Apostle Paul, in the last days of his life, writing to his younger friend and protege, Timothy. And to his friend, Timothy, Paul wrote, make an effort to present yourself to God as a tried and true worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, but is one who interprets the message of truth correctly. When we talk about growing through studying the Bible, that's pretty much what we're talking about. It's actually kind of simple and straightforward. It's not necessarily easy, but it's kind of simple. And it's what I pray that all of us, 
as the body of Christ, as a church family, will continue to grow into. Every one of us growing toward God's goal of being fully mature believers who are ready to take our place in doing the work of the kingdom in our world. Let's bow our heads and close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for the dedicated servants of yours who wrote the books, the collection of books that we call the Bible. Thank you for the people who collected the books and gathered them together. Thank you for the hundreds and thousands of scribes who patiently, painstakingly hand-copied these books through the centuries. Printing wasn't invented until the 1500s so that we could have them today. Thank you for the role your spirit played in guiding them to write and to collect and to copy. And thank you for the role that you play in guiding us as we study. Make us into growing, maturing, faithful believers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.